Good evening, everyone, and uh, once again, thank you for joining us for this uh, Lenten lecture series and uh, the last one today with uh, Father Peter Knox about uh, ecological conversion. So without wasting any more time, we'll invite uh, Father Peter Knox to share his words of wisdom again. <laughs> thank you, Father. Thank you, Dr. Knox. Thank you, Dr. Slobo. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. You're all very welcome. Uh, as Father Slobo said, this is the final of the Lenten Lecture Series, which is co-presented by the Jesuit Institute in South Africa and the Social Apostolate Desk and Migration Desk of the Jesuits in Southern Africa. So that South Africa, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Zambia, Lesotho, Botswana, Eswatini, and Zambia and Malawi. So thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure to be hosting you again. Um, and we're not going to spend too much time or waste any time. I'm, I'll just remind us of the little journey that we've taken so far over these six weeks. Those of you who've been here with us for six weeks, on the 20th of February, that is the that is the first Wednesday, first Tuesday of Lent, we had an introduction to the series. And specifically, what is the question about conversion and why Pope Francis is encouraging us to have an ecological conversion in particular. Um, then the following week, the following Tuesday, we spoke about creation as God's gift and the various different narratives and stories that there are about creation. Some Christian stories, some Jewish stories, some scientific, and all of us, all of this points to the fact that we're totally dependent on God. We're totally dependent on our environment. There's no other planet, there's no other place which is not God's creation to which we can go. Sometimes we think we're masters of this creation. In fact, God is the one and only master, the one and only person in charge of creation. On the 5th of March, we looked at the teaching of various popes um, before Pope Francis. In fact, the teaching tradition of the church about creation. We looked also outside of the Catholic Church, outside of the church in South Africa, the church in Germany. We looked at the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew. He's teaching that destruction of the environment is sin. Anything we do that makes our home any less livable for our brothers and sisters on this planet. Pope Bartholomew was very, Patriarch Bartholomew was very, very clear that this is social sin, that we're sinning both against creation and against our neighbors who live on this planet. We also looked at the teaching of the World Council of Churches. And so the, we looked at the whole swathe of Christian teaching, not just the Roman Catholic or the Catholic tradition. On the 12th of March, we looked at a little bit of the science and a little bit of modern contemporary scientific studies and research about the things that are going wrong with our home. We looked, I focused particularly on the, the planetary boundaries theory, which is really the most contemporary up-to-date theory, which looks at nine different parameters which our world is kind of in within those nine parameters, which make life livable on the planet for human beings. If we push our planet too much in one direction or the other, it becomes a very uncomfortable place for us to live. And so that was on the 12th of, 12th of March. Last week, we looked at the compendium of social teaching of the Catholic Church, specifically chapter 10 of that compendium, where we... Where the, where the compendium talks about caring for our environment, protecting our environment. And so we've got a long, um, a long set of five weeks behind us. And our final talk today is going to be about what I can do. I've heard all of this. I've seen all of this. I understand a lot of it. And a lot of it we don't understand yet. But the question is, what can we do? And our ecological spirituality that Pope Francis talks about should express itself in ecological action. There should be a consequence, uh, a, a unity between our spirituality and our action. So that's what I hope to address with us today, this evening, what we can do about our environmental problems and what we as Christians should be doing. 
One of the messages of Jesus Christ is very clear right from the very beginning of the gospel. He says, repent and believe the good news. And he uses this Greek word here, metanoia, or the Greek verb metanoiain. Metanoia is to repent, to convert, to change, to start living differently, to go from an old way to a new way in life. So Jesus' message right at the beginning, repent and believe the good news. But it's not just believe, we have to live the good news. As Christians, particularly during Lent, we think about how we should be living differently, how we can improve our lifestyle, our way of relating to one another, our way of relating to the world. And this change, this revolution, should be lasting it should be not just for five weeks of Lent or six weeks of Lent, but it's something, it's a habit we get into that can inform and guide our behavior, even as we go beyond Lent, into the Easter season, into the ordinary time of the year, into the season of creation. Uh, our Lenten conversion journey should help us to live differently all the way through the future. It should be voluntary. It should be something I take on for myself and not coming from outside, not Pope Francis telling me what to do, but something that I embrace with my heart and I want to live with my heart. It's not compelled. It's my choice, my family's choice, my the choice of the people I'm living with and working with. It's something that we embrace fully and wholeheartedly. Conversion is aimed at something higher, aimed at something beyond ourselves, aimed at caring for a much, much wider universe than ourselves, much more than just me and my immediate neighborhood or my immediate kind of uh, set of friends or circle of family or whatever. We're aiming at something which is transcendental. We're aiming at kind of what God would like to see happening in God's world, the, the good that God would that God has invested in the world, the good with which God has created the world. Conversion is something which goes beyond me to something which is going to serve my brothers and sisters, not just today, but for all time. Conversion is something where I say there should be some consequence or some, some linking up, some articulation, some joining between our heart, our mind, and our actions. It's not just oh, I've got a mental conversion, I know what has to be done, um, my heart feels for the earth, but I'm not able to live that out in my daily lifestyle. Conversion is something which brings these three together. And we'll see that in Laudato Si a little bit more when we look at chapters five and six of Laudato Si this evening. And many of us Maybe you've lived before with a converted smoker or somebody who stopped drinking and they have a certain amount of missionary fervor and they'll try and convince the rest of the world to give up smoking or drinking. Or if somebody's kind of become a real pain in the neck because he's become or she's become vegetarian or vegan and is trying to impose that on the rest of the world, I think we have to be a little bit understanding of our brothers and sisters who've had a conversion experience and who they would really like to share that with, with other people. At the end of the Gospels, Jesus says, go out to the whole world and preach the good news. Okay, this is the good news. This is what Jesus encourages us to do. So we have missionary zeal and fervor that we want to encourage our brothers and sisters also to live a better life for the planet. And this, this Buddhist philosopher says, if we don't change our direction, we're going to carry on in exactly the same way that we're headed. Change doesn't just happen. We have to actually make an effort to change our direction. I referred to the Pope's encyclical on care for our common home. We'll just have a look very quickly at what's in chapter five and what's in chapter six. We're not going to go in detail there, but you'll notice that chapter five Pope Francis is telling us how to act. Pope chapter 6, again, Francis is giving us guidelines for action. And if you look at chapter 5, it's all about dialogue. Dialogue, 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 dialogue. The five sections of chapter 5 all relate to dialogue. At the international level, so between 
nations in the United Nations. That's going on all the time. I've been to four of these big United Nations, international United Nations meetings where we have representatives from the whole world talking and battling and fighting over one or two words in some resolution, trying to make the best resolution for their own countries and for the world at large. And so that's dialogue. It's largely between heads of state or diplomats. Pope Francis addresses that and says that's really important. Dialogue for local policies and national policies. We, in South Africa, we're approaching an election at the moment. Are we taking seriously the possibility of electing people who care for our environment, who are thinking of the future of South Africa, who are thinking of, future, of the future for the children who are going to come after us, people who are going to do away with coal once and for all, slowly but definitely. We have to do away with coal, we have to do away with fossil fuels, we have to do away with fracking, we have to do away with oil, because these are greenhouse gas generating fossil fuels. And so we can embrace or at least address our local and national policy makers. We dialogue, we try to have transparency in the decision-making process. In South Africa, we've had what's called state capture, where it's corruption at the highest level, where there's secrecy at the highest level, where you've got people with agendas and investments at the highest level, and they certainly don't want transparency. They try to keep things away from the public eye. Pope Francis is saying that dialogue has to take place in an open, transparent manner. Um, politics and economics are there not to just keep the political wheels turning or just to keep the economics of the major multinationals turning, not to just keep kind of the local economies kind of making the rich richer and kind of taking as much from the world as possible. Economics is about human fulfillment. Economics is about the poorest becoming at least more dignified in the lifestyle they're able to live. They're able to kind of clothe themselves, feed themselves, clean themselves, uh, be nourished, have a healthy lifestyle. That's human fulfillment. And that's the purpose of economics. Economics is not there for its own right. It's there to serve the people. And then finally, we've had this crazy idea for many, many years that religion and science are somehow in opposition to each other, that religion and science, our faith and our intellect um, are somehow enemies of each other, that faith doesn't require intellect or understanding. Really, since the, the Enlightenment in Western Europe, where science has been going off on its own trajectory, following its own path, and faith has been trying to catch up, and faith is saying science is somehow making people less faithful. Um, that's been part of our history. And since the Second Vatican Council, since the 1960s, the church has realized, and churches around the world have realized, that science can in fact inform our faith, make our faith more more reasonable, more logical. We don't have to deny um, Big Bang Theory. We don't have to deny um, what I've mentioned previously, um, creation and evolution. We can say these two discourses, they use different sets of evidence, but they're not trying to disprove each other. So the dialogue of faith and science is important. Uh, here we have a dialogue between two very, very early saints of the Christian church. We've got St. Peter here, the older guy, with the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And he disagreed with St. Paul. St. Peter was the apostle for the Jews. St. Paul had the vision to go to the Gentiles, to go beyond Judaism. St. Paul writes many of his letters here. Some of them, sure, to a Jewish audience, but some of them also to audiences who are not Jewish, whom he encountered along his many, many pastoral journeys. And they had to come to an understanding. They had to come to a mutual respect and recognition that, you know, there's more than one, there's enough space in the church for more than one set of ideas. So Peter and Paul had to dialogue. And we have 
Paul going up to Jerusalem and Paul learning and sitting at, Pe at Peter's feet or sitting at the feet of the, of the early Jerusalem Christians who'd encountered Jesus, who lived with Jesus, which Paul never did. And so even in the church, right back in the very first century, we've had people dialoguing with each other. It's not Pope Francis's new idea and synodality. We all have to sit and listen to each other. This goes all the way back to the very first Christian century. In chapter six of Laudato Si, Pope Francis concentrates on two things, spirituality and education. Our spirituality should be informed by a good education. Spirituality should lead us to a new lifestyle. So these are the seven or eight headings or subheadings of chapter six of Laudato Si. Spirituality, education, helps us to embrace or choose or decide to take on a new style of life. He talks about the throwaway lifestyle and he proposes a different kind of lifestyle. And it's not, it's not highly technical. It's not beyond anybody's ability to read or understand. Pope Francis is suggesting that we take a new kind of lifestyle. There should be a covenant. There should be a give and take. There's a reciprocity, a mutuality uh, a necessary connection between humans and the environment we live in. The environment sustains us. Everything we get is from our environment, ultimately. And human beings should be caring for the environment in return. There's a give and take, there's a back and forth relationship. And that's part of a, 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 an education. We need to teach our children that. We need to learn that ourselves those of us who are adults. Then we've had ecological conversion. That's another part of this chapter six, where Pope Francis is saying precisely what's going on in this little diagram here. We can't carry on flying in the same direction and all moving off in the same direction. It's liberating to sort of break ranks. It's liberating to move beyond what we've been taught and what we've we thought we've understood for years and years and years and centuries. When we sort of have a new insight, it's liberating to go off and sort of fly a path which you know is your path and the path that the earth is inviting you to fly. The, um, that's conversion, ecological conversion. And Pope Francis says it's not all about duty and doom and gloom and heaviness and we're all going to, this whole planet is going to hell and we're all going to sort of burn or fry or whatever global warming is going to do to us. There should be love and joy. And here again, Pope Francis refers back to Saint Francis of Assisi, the saint of peace and joy, joy in the environment, joy in discovering what God has put there for us. Similarly, within our civil, political setup, um, there should be love. He wrote that encyclical Fratelli Tutti about mutual love and social love. He wrote it, as you may remember, during the COVID pandemic, where he pointed out how separated and how isolated people are from one another, how we're pulling in so many different directions. Pope Francis said, no, we should really love one another. And he called that political love. It's not a love of a husband and a wife. It's not a love of a parent and a child. It's really a love for the environment and a love for one another. Um, sacramental signs. The earth is God's gift to us. The, God, the earth is God's self-communication to us. We can see in the earth. I saw a cat today. It had killed a bird, a baby, a karoo thrush. And the cat was playing with it. The cat was having such joy playing with that dead bird, which I don't know where he had got it. Um, and it was celebrating, and it was celebrating its own life. It was celebrating the prey that it had uh, got, caught. Um, Pope Francis says, we celebrate, we, we enjoy what the world has given to us. And the, and the world is God's self-communication. That's a way where we can obtain grace through natural things grace of living the way the life God has asked us to live. And he encourages us to rest as on the seventh day, God rested. We celebrate our rest as well. We take our rest. We allow the earth to rest. We allow the earth to have sabbatical years. We allow fields to lie fallow. We help our world to 
recover from the, the extreme um, abuse that we human beings, agriculturalists, builders have, subje have subjected it to. Um, then in the next section, Pope Francis talks about the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all having a relationship with the earth. God communicates God's self in so many different ways through the Son, who's our Redeemer, through the Holy Spirit, who continues to empower us and inspire us, even when we're a little bit lost for what to do and lost for words. Um, the Father, who's the Creator, all of these members of the Trinity, all three members of the Trinity, have a unique relationship and a combined relationship, which is really pulling us in one direction, that is, towards God. Then, as we normally have in in ecclesiastical writings, in writings of popes and bishops and things like that, there's a prayer to Mary or there's a consideration of Mary, somehow the queen of all creation or the mother of the church or Mary who's an example for us of what we might become. Mary who's the closest to God's will for the earth and who's the closest to understanding what her son Jesus came to teach us. And so Mary, in relation to creation, is what God, is what Pope Francis gives us. And then he says, um, it's not just about this world, our solar system, our planet. There's a much, much greater universe, which is beyond our comprehension. But God is the Lord of the whole universe, beyond the sun. And Pope Francis encourages us to think more universally. Think of God as the God of everywhere. 13.7 billion light years across. Uh, that's, what, that's what God is encouraging us, Pope Francis is encouraging us to think about when we think of God. So going back to education, um, an ecological education, I followed a little bit this website, which is called transgressivelearning.org. And they help people to have a much, much more organic relationship to the world. It's not just thinking in straight lines and thinking, this is my subject, I'm a mathematician, this is my subject, I'm an English teacher. Pope Francis is encouraging us as well to think much, much more um, integrally in our education and in our and in our relationship to the universe. I remember during the 1980s, the 1990s, and the early 2000s, there's a school here in Johannesburg called Sacred Heart College, and they had something called an integrated curriculum, or they did something with called integrated studies. It was not only the inspiration of one of the Marist brothers, Brother Neil McGurk, but he had the whole, at least from the outside, I was never teaching there, he had the whole um, school, all the, all the teachers there thinking along the lines of how do we integrate our social and our political and our scientific and our religious education. Pope Francis is trying to get us to do the same as well. Integral ecology. Um, everything is, we have to break the boundaries. We have to transgress um, what we've been told. This is not your subject, that's your subject. We have to go beyond our silos. We have to escape our silo mentality. We have to ask our things, ourselves how things relate to each other. We can't just have food. My food is in one set of ideas. My transport is another set of ideas. The way I live, the building I live is another set of ideas. My faith is another silo. Pope Francis is encouraging us to break down our silo mentality, to break down the education which many of us have received, which said this is this and that is that, and never the twain shall meet. We're encouraged to go beyond silo mentality. And finally, Laudato Si, the encyclical on care for our common home, Pope Francis gives us two prayers. And at the Jesuit Institute where I'm working at the moment, we're going through bit by bit those prayers of St. Francis. At midday, we all come together in the chapel, those of us who work here and those of us who live here. We, we're using what, one or two of these prayers from Pope Francis, praying for the earth and praying with other Christians in union with creation, giving glory to God in union with creation. So if you're looking for a spiritual moment, if you're looking for something kind of which might inform your prayer life, 
you'll find number 178 and number 179 in Pope Francis's encyclical. Um, you'll find two very nice prayers, prayers that you can pray with, even with people who are not Christian or people who, who don't believe in a creator God. Um, they can also pray and speak to or address the deepest part of themselves and pray for the earth. While we're on the, on the topic of prayer and conversion, I've kind of come up with some sort of working with Naudato Si for, for a while, uh, working with ecological spirituality for a while. I've come up with some of the aspects or dimensions of our spiritual life, which I've put down in the left-hand column, humility, praise, awe and wonder, obedience. And I've tried to link them to um, our, our, our care for the universe, our, our uh, Laudato Si. Firstly, in humility, we have to admit that we did not make ourselves. We are contingent beings. We're not um, self-made beings. We got life and we're going to receive death. And these are pretty much beyond our own control. We praise God for the gift of life the gift which we're enjoying, which we're benefiting from at the moment. And possibly some of us believe in an afterlife. We can praise God for the gift of that afterlife as well. We should be in awe and wonder of at least the size of the universe, the marvels of creation, that it all sort of fits together. When it works, it works incredibly well. It's like a well-oiled clock, a well-oiled machine. In obedience, we do what God has asked us to do. We follow what some people call the natural law. God created all creatures with a purpose. Everything, even this mosquito that was buzzing around my office um, two minutes ago, is created for a purpose. My spiritual connection is with other people. I don't live by myself and for myself. All of us are interdependent. Every creature is interdependent on every other creature. So there's a, there's a dimension of solidarity rather than individualism in my own, my own spiritual life, in our spiritual life. Spirituality should, can, possibly, encourage us to yearn for justice. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for what is right, or for righteousness, or for justice. And in in ecological terms or in social, ecological, environmental terms, we really yearn for those people who are most vulnerable. We yearn on their behalf that they may have a greater, fairer share of the goods of society, of the goods of the earth that God has put there for everybody. We did that last week in the social teaching of the church. Reconciliation. Pope Francis in, is encouraging us to be reconciled to the world, to befriend our world, to enjoy the world and know that the world might even benefit from us. We need a consistency between our intellectual, our spiritual life, and our lifestyle. We, so this ecological conversion requires us to make, invites us to make some kind of change in our lifestyle, no matter how small. I'm a person in a culture. My spirituality is informed by the Catholic culture. The culture, um, I was living in kind of a very, very Western world or South African Western Umlungu world until I went to live in Soweto for a couple of years. And then I went to KZN. I've lived in Kenya for the last 10 years. And each of these cultures informs us. And we sort of get shaped by the culture that we're living in the music, the dance, the ideas, the way that people relate to the world around them. So culture is an important thing, and our global culture needs to change. Again, Pope Francis talks about the throwaway culture, and that needs to change. And spirituality is a spirituality of patience. We know that the world is not going to change tomorrow. Reversing global climate change will take decades. Um, Undoing the damage which has been done to the earth will take decades. So we need a patient spirituality and not get too frustrated. Uh, we need to be reconciled to the world, as Pope Francis says. Befriend a gecko. I've just said that there's a gecko in my bathroom, and I see it every, every afternoon. I see it there in the bathroom, on the window, chasing insects. 
on the inside of the bathroom. It's my friend. Other people would say, oh, oh, that's dirty. Get rid of it or chase it away or throw it outside. No, I mean, it's part of creation. And a little bit of creation has decided to stay inside my bathroom. And that's great. I'm happy with that. Uh, be reconciled to the world. Go out every day. Smell the flowers. Kind of smell the roses, as they used to say in the 1970s. Now they say, smell the coffee. Some of my colleagues need to smell the coffee before the day begins. Okay. Um, be reconciled to the world. Go outside every day. Even when I was living in Canada for five years, I would go outside every single day. Even if it was minus 40 degrees outside, I would go outside. You have to breathe fresh air. Plant a tree, preferably an indigenous tree that will kind of give space for birds and bees and animals and things. It'll give space, it'll kind of green your environment. Um, if, you, if you've got the space, you can grow a vegetable garden and feed directly from or benefit directly from the work of your own hands. Avoid climate anxiety. Many young people are very concerned about what the future holds. Many young people are very worried that their future is going to be very different to the past that we have lived or the present that we are living because climate change is going to make such a difference to the way uh, the world goes. If we go beyond one and a half degrees, two degrees, three degrees, which are real distinct possibilities, um, young people are concerned about that. So if we can avoid climate anxiety, it's good for our own peace of mind. If we can give reason to young people to trust that God's got the future in, under control, that's very helpful as well. Um, encourage nature, actually encourage nature. Keep your windows open, allow the insects to come in. The only, use a mosquito net if necessary. Um, and if you don't have space to plant a tree, then maybe you can sponsor a tree at a school where they don't have money or they don't have they don't have the resources to be tree planting. You can kind of uh, help a school uh, parish somewhere close to you to grow a tree and plant a tree. You don't have to put your name on it. This tree was planted by by Wangari Mathai, or this tree was planted by Pope Francis or by whoever you are, you don't need a name on there. The, the tree will be your legacy. You could audit your family's ecological footprint. This idea of ecological footprints was very popular in the early 2000s. You can see, you know what? Am I really stepping very heavily on the earth? Am I taking lots and lots of uh, space and land How's my family's ecological footprint? Are we squashing so much of the natural land? Many of us, I'm presuming, live in an in urban environment. So we've got a little footprint of urban land. Um, the paper we use, the, the, the forests support us. Uh, we're taking land for energy, for example, the oil we burn, the the trees we burn, if, we, if we're burning wood and things like that. Many of us are still carnivores, and so the animals we eat have to graze, they have to be fed from land. We grow, our crops grow on land, and things like that. Um, some of us eat fish, some of us don't eat fish, and fish um, also have a certain amount of space and this idea was put forward by a Canadian doctoral student called Mathis Wackernagel, and he's the president now of the Global Footprint Network. And we, we all have a network. Some of us tread very lightly on the earth. Some of us have a very heavy footprint on the earth. Some of us drive big, heavy four by fours. Other of us, others of us drive slightly smaller, less, um, less consumptive vehicles. So our footprint relates to the food we eat, the transport we use, the way we relax, the electronics we buy, the electronics we use, the buildings we're in, the heating, the cooking, what keeps our buildings going. And this idea of ecological fit footprint is measured in terms of global hectares per person. How many hectares does it take to help me to live or to support my lifestyle 
that I've become accustomed to. At the beginning of Lent, I was looking at this, this website, the National Catholic Reporter online. It's an American Catholic newspaper, um, which was giving us suggestions for an eco-friendly Lent, uh, recipes for an eco-friendly Lent. And I'm not boasting or anything like that, but our community here in Johannesburg has three meatless meals per week. We go vegetarian three times a week. And this could be a quite a culture shock to some of our to some of our members of the community. It might be something that you have difficulty doing yourself. But there are lots of very, very easy ways to reduce our ecological footprint. Um, and we'll just have a look very quickly at the 10 heaviest or the 10 biggest ecological footprints in the world and the 10 biggest ecological footprints in Africa. Countries like Qatar, Kuwait, and the United Arab Emirates, they have to import everything. Remember, they're desert countries. And Denmark is a freezing, cold, frigid. Canada is a cold, frigid country way up in the north. And they have to heat the, the three countries on the, way, on the left here on your screen. They have to cool their environment. And that takes a lot of energy. The food they eat has to be transported. If we look at the African countries, tiny island nation here, a desert island here, a desert country here, another desert country, Botswana, South Africa, the so-called most developed country, we've got one of the heaviest ecological footprints in Africa. If we think of that our population is 60 million people, and we would need, if this is our ecological footprint, we would need 157, 157 million hectares of land to support the average South African or to support our entire population living at 2.59 hectares per person. The trouble is we've only got 122 hectares in the entire country. So we're living beyond our country's carrying capacity. We're living beyond what South Africa would normally be able to provide to our population. So altogether, not only in South Africa, the world is overextended. The world cannot keep pace with the demands that are being made of the world for food, for lumber, for oil, for everything. Our world is kind of being stretched beyond its means. We're living on borrowed resources. We're living on borrowed time. And how do we reduce our footprint? We go back to this little, this little diagram here and say, how can I take less and use less of the space that God has given to us here in South Africa? And it should be a cause for concern. And South Africa is facing global climate change. Um, there is no... Planet B. I'm sure you've heard that before. There is no plan B. There's no alternative. We don't know of another planet in the entire universe that supports life the way our planet supports life. We're particularly vulnerable in South Africa, vulnerable to global to heating particularly. We're highly dependent on oil or coal. Think of all of our power stations. How many of them depend on coal? Think of the way that Gwede Mantashe has tried to entrench coal and diesel and now gas as the sources of energy, how resistant he is to, um, to alternative transitional uh, energy sources. Certainly we need coal, possibly we need coal and gas and oil for a time, but why do we not have the political will to move beyond our, our dependence on fossil fuels? The world is your heritage. What you hand on to your children and grandchildren, they're going to look back and say, 50 years ago, you, that is us, were living in a fool's paradise. We have to be informed. Our decisions have to be informed. I think I'm doing a great job replacing a typical car with a hybrid vehicle. And the Jesuits here in Johannesburg have one hybrid vehicle. But in fact, the total, so this is a kind of increasing scale of kind of the difference we can make, uh, the impact we can make by the choices we make. So we've got, a, we've got a hybrid vehicle. Maybe that saves us one ton of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. 
So changing over to a hybrid vehicle can reduce our carbon dioxide output without doubt, carbon dioxide equivalent without doubt, but it's not as significant as we think it is. Much more significant would be to go car free, to live a car free life. There we'd, we'd save maybe two and a half tons of carbon dioxide equivalents per year. Um, changing our energy, changing our light bulbs, for example, using LED lights, that's got a very small but significant impact on the our contribution to climate change. Recycling is significant, but we have to realize it's we're doing something significant, but it's really minimal in its contribution. They say, obviously, this is not published by a Catholic um, website, uh, but they say the greatest contribution that an average well-developed country could make is to have one fewer child in the family. There we would save 60 tons of carbon dioxide equivalents in a year. So if we have one child fewer, or it's too late now because we've got our children, if we have one child fewer, we would save 60 tons of carbon dioxide emissions per year. And so we, so something, a very, very simple graphic like this would tell us how we could make uh, significant reductions. If we have a meat-free diet, so what they're calling a plant-based diet, we'd save more than one ton of carbon dioxide per year. Our lifestyle can change, refuse, reduce, reuse, repurpose, recycle. I'm sure many of us heard of have heard of these five Re's, the five Re's they're called. Um, and reduce, reuse, especially packaging. And by packaging, I also include um, fast fashion. Fashion is the way we package ourselves. It's the way we present ourselves. When we've finished our shower or our bath in the morning, we package ourselves we show ourselves, we dress up, and fast fashion is a very, very wasteful way of packaging ourselves. We should reduce, refuse plastic bags, refuse single-use plastic bottles. We should only print using wood and paper and pulp when totally necessary. We should reject every time our cell phone company wants to give us a new phone at the end of a contract. We should reject it. We don't need a new phone. They're in the business of selling phones. They're in the business of making us desire more and more and different and brighter and faster and fancier phones with three cameras on the back or five cameras on the back. They don't, we don't need these things. My camera's only got, sorry, my phone has only got one camera on the back, not that, not that, one camera. And I can still take perfectly decent pictures. Not that that's what I use my phone for, but Businesses are in the job of selling, making money, and they make things so that you want something brighter and faster and, and with bigger memory and whatever. And this goes back to the 1950s. Um, this man, Clifford Brooks Stevens, he was born in 1911. He died in 1975. And he admitted quite candidly, he worked for um, Harley Davidson and he admitted quite candidly that we make people want more. We make them want something that's new. That's the way the economy works. And if you look at a company like iPhone, I'm sorry I'm singling out iPhone, but I found this graphic quite useful. You've got the board of directors of iPhone very, very happily saying that we have built in obsolescence into our iPhone. It's designed not to last more than a year. Our de design flaws completely outweigh Samsung's de design flaws. Our phone is made of a thin, soft aluminium that's going to get scratched. Our, our screen is going to get uh, um, shattered or will, will break. Um, the fingerprint mechanism is going to wear out eventually. The power button will get stuck, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, they're aware of these design limitations and still they build the latest iPhone with these design limitations. A member of the community, a member of the Jesuit Institute spoke to me yesterday about his mother's, in fact, his grandmother's Kenwood chef, that is the kitchen mixer, the mixer in his grandmother's kitchen, and it's still going how many decades later the Kenwood Chef was designed to last? If you think of your cell phone, 
is that designed to last? And so if we've got, if we can just kind of make comparisons like that, when last did you change your motor car? I was speaking to someone very recently who wants to change her car, and she's probably going to get stranded technology by buying a petrol car. Pope so Francis says we have to move beyond the throwaway culture in Laudato Si. We use things, we enjoy them, and we tend to throw away. But the question I asked you last week is where is a way? Everything goes somewhere. Things don't just disappear into the great blue beyond. Uh, things go somewhere. And Francis in Laudato Si says that if we have that attitude for material things, we can also have that attitude for people, that we throw people away, our brothers and sisters, the elderly, nobody is disposable, the poor, we just dismiss them, we write them off, we walk away from them. Pope Francis says we should really be going to encounter people, he writes that in Fratelli Tutti, the culture of encounter, rather than the culture of getting rid of people and getting rid of things. Um, in Laudate Deum, a very small, short document he wrote last year, he says that there are no cultural changes without personal changes. I have to change my behavior. And only when there are larger numbers of people making personal changes can cultural changes happen. Cultural changes are lasting changes to the shared way of thoughts, beliefs, values, the things we do, the procedures, the relationships. And so Pope Francis says, individuals and cultures go hand in hand. A little bit later, he says, you know, it's a little bit more complicated than that because political changes have to take place. Nobody is an island. I depend on people and other people depend on me. We've had that before, the African notion of interdependence, Ubuntu. Communities need to con convert. And this is a political action. And Pope Francis talks about politics in Laudato Si. And he says that sometimes we have to exert pressure on our government. Sometimes we have to use civil and civic organizations to actually make political changes. And we need concerted action. Everybody in the town or everybody in the parish making, writing a letter to or addressing our members of parliament. These activities have to be um, have to be kind of together joint activities don't be misled by romantic ideas oh i'll write to my member of parliament and everything will change i'll just plant another speck worm and and global warming will be resolved we have to kind of have really informed ideas um there's the laudato C action plan there's a website for laudato C action plan i've pointed that out to you before we, we can have an action plan for our home, for our school, for our parish, for our village, for our work. We kind of try work together with other people that makes life easier. There's also a South African Faith Communities Environmental Initiative, which is a multi-faith organization, people of all sorts of faiths working together to make changes to South Africa. It's political, and we have to work with political realities. We have to become citizen activists, if that's possible. We have to sort of say, um, we, we work together. We oppose new fossil fuel exploration or exploitation. We protest when wetlands are being threatened. On Sunday, I was having a talk at the parish in Bramfontein, the parish that the Jesuits run in Bramfontein. And one of the members of the parish there said, do we protest? when wetlands are threatened or when they build a new shopping mall inside a wetland. And she was quite clear that this does take place. There's no question that this takes place. And we really need to do something about it. The businesses aren't going to hold back. They want to build in the easiest places. We should demand subsidies for clean energy, um, for, for clean vehicles. We should demand that the government put as much money into renewable energy as it does into fossil fuels. We can start using electric vehicles. That makes a slightly bigger difference to our energy footprint, our environmental footprint. We use public transport. We oppose fracking. So that in South Africa, we did that very successfully. But Shell is going to come back again. And they're going to say, look, 
we want to frack in the Karoo or we want to frack off the, off the coast, of, of the south coast, plant more trees. These are all activities we can be involved in, differences that we can make. We've got good, sometimes environmental laws, and so we shouldn't try to go behind the law or skirt around the law or manipulate the law to suit ourselves. We, if we're in the business of making um, projects and projects which are potentially disruptive, we should do an honest environmental impact assessment. If our, if our business, if our school, if our parish is going to do something which will be disruptive, we should, if we're planning to chop down a tree, even in our own garden, we should think or chop down a whole lot of vegetation in the garden. We should think, what is the environmental impact there? What's going to happen? What's going to change if we get rid of these plants or we chase out we put rat traps or something like that. What's the environmental impact? We should think globally because our environment it has no borders, but we should act locally in a way that, that makes a difference locally. We shouldn't allow our elected employees to be minimalist or to shirk their responsibilities. We should hold them to account. They're being paid salaries to do jobs that we expect them to do. We really feel sometimes quite disempowered as citizens in South Africa because we accept uselessness. We accept people doing as little as they possibly can. Um, now, this Laudato Deum, which Pope Francis published last year, number 69, he said cultural change is very important, but most effective solutions will come from major political decisions at the national or the global level. So we change our local culture, we change the way we live, but really we need political decisions at the local and global level. And that's why we need to be citizen activists. And finally, somebody mentioned this to me last Wednesday. Last, last Wednesday, um, We used to say this during the years of apartheid, during the years when we were, we were um, really on the verge of great internal civil conflict. We used to say, if you want peace, work for justice. If you want environmental peace, we have to work for environmental justice. If we want our, our world not to collapse around us, then we need to work for environmental justice. And you know that song, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. So there's so much we can do, so much that we really give us the sense that we're not disempowered, that we're not disconnected. No matter how small it is, it is significant in my world, it's significant in my life, and ultimately we can be part of cultural changes. And hopefully cultural changes will then move us to be political change makers as well. I'm sorry I've gone over time, but we still have time for a little bit of question and answer discussion. Yeah, we have about six minutes. Thanks, Ntate Knox. Thank you so much for that. Uh, maybe you can stop I'll sharing, stop sharing. Screen, please. I'll stop Thank sharing. You. Here we go. Yeah, uh, there's already one, one question which takes you to, I think, week one on the chat box from uh, uh, Bright uh, Masikati. Sorry to take you back on this. Uh, uh, there's still one of your slides from lecture one. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, it's about carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and current global uh, temperatures. It seems that there is a trend in both charts showing that almost the same thing happens every thousand years. I don't quite remember how you may have explained it, but I'm just thinking that if that has been the trend every thousand years, how much of industrialization and all the other factors we are pinning this current tragedy on on have really influenced the increase the increases in co2 and global temperatures especially in considering the differences in industrialization across these time these time periods okay Let's thank you bright thank you for taking us back to that many people don't see the connection between the industrial period so since the middle of the 18th century in europe when the industrial revolution really began and the increase in carbon dioxide concentration 
in the atmosphere and the increase in temperature. So the temperature follows slowly behind the increase in carbon dioxide. Yes, the world has gone through over the last several hundred thousand years. The world has gone through um, times of high carbon dioxide concentration and low carbon dioxide concentration. There have been fluctuations in the world's temperature, but what we really need to know is that human beings can only survive within a particular temperature range. Mammals and the, the, the higher vertebrates can only survive within a particular temperature range. And we're moving out of that temperature range. And the world is becoming warm, in some places too warm. The world is becoming too wet, too dry, too arid in some places. And that really traces, and the graphs I was showing you were to show you that there's a very close relationship between carbon dioxide concentrations and the Earth's temperature. And certainly before human beings ever existed, before you and me and my granny and my great grandmother were ever on this planet, there were temperature variations. There were dinosaurs, there were kind of animals which have gone extinct, and we're in danger of making more animals and more species extinct. And ultimately, the human species could become distinct if the world is not in a within a particular temperature range that mammals can survive, warm-blooded creatures can survive. I, so I can't go into the details. I'm not going into Good. the mathematics. Uh, any... Oh, yes. <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't see any other question. I don't know if anybody else has a, a question. Um, I, I don't see anyone. Um, so we have two minutes left. Any takers, any one brave enough to go for the last few minutes, uh, take a question. Okay, um, it doesn't look like there's anybody else. So uh, in the absence of any questions, I would like to thank everybody uh, for participating in these uh, Lenten lecture series for the past, uh, that we've been having for six weeks. And uh, I suppose there are many things that came up and uh, many, uh, many suggestions that came up. And, you know, I hope everybody has reached some level of conversion and conviction that we need to to uh, do something about climate change. And you can get more ideas. Uh, I've put in two links there on Laurato Sea Week, which is on the night from the 19th to the 26th of May. They have they also have uh, some suggestions. The season of creation is coming up from the 1st of September to the 4th of October where we will also be having uh, the Christian community uh, kind of, you know, raising this awareness on the issue of climate change and the need or the agency to change. And in, in between that, we have uh, international days, of, of course, uh, the United Nations International Days, which I will also uh, post on the chat box, where you can also do something uh, or with either as an individual or with your community where you find yourself to be, uh, to raise awareness and to help people uh, to change their way, their ways uh, or mitigating factors as it were. So uh, on behalf of uh, the Society of Jesus, the Social Apostolate uh, Commission and uh, the Jesuit Institute, we would like to thank uh, uh, Father Knox for all that uh, uh, knowledge that he has shared with us. We also would like, we hope, we hope that these lectures, they have helped us to understand from our, not only scientific uh, uh, aspects that uh, Father Peter Knox explained so well, but also from our faith, the need to change. And lastly, we'd like to thank all those who have made donations to the Jesuit Institute. Uh, we thank you for your generosity and we hope that uh, uh, you have a blessed uh, Holy Week and uh, joyous Easter celebrations. 
with those words, we thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Knox, again, for sharing with us your knowledge and helping us understand the need to ecological conversion. It's highly appreciated. And thank you all for joining with us during this uh, season of Lent, trying to understand this agency. Many thanks, and God bless you all, and have a blessed Easter weekend. And thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. God thank bless you. and happy Easter to everyone.